You're listening to the Station 71 Podcast with your hosts, Mario, Beth, and Brian. So, this week we are going to finish up our very short, in-depth tour of Animal Kingdom. Um, But first, as always, let's dive into the news, talk about some stuff that's going on in Walt Disney World. So, first up, we have some Skyliner pillars popping up in Caribbean Beach Resort. We've kind of followed the Skyliner pretty closely here, but this one is uh, very interesting. I know we were kind of discussing this a little bit before the show started but there's some skyliner pillars popping up around the resort in the resort next to guest rooms um it's very i don't know how to phrase it but it breaks the sight lines pretty bad here it's (laughs) quite jarring yeah that's exactly it um how do you guys feel about this i've been kind of skeptical of the skyliner from like the very beginning but i don't know this is just this just looks bad like in my opinion Mm -hmm. i just it totally ruins the aesthetic yeah i've been trying not to judge these things too much because i know they're not finished yet and i know that they'll look better than they do right now when they're finished but it's still a giant concrete pole in the middle of yeah, you know, of this resort, and it's hard for me to picture them making this look not unsightly, so Yeah, I, I mean, know. like, what's the best they can do is paint it. Mm-hmm. Well, and my big thing is the placement of them is just so odd. Like, it goes right through the, the resort, and there's yeah. photos in here. I, I mean, obviously, I'm going to link them in the show notes, but... It goes right by the balcony, and that's just so weird to me. Like, what if you have that one room, and you can kind of see it if you scroll down in these pictures. It's the second to last one. It literally sits right in front of the window on that that resort room. Mm-hmm. So, like, what if you have that corner room? Are you getting, like, a view of the Skyliner pole? God, I hope that would be at a discounted rate, but right. no, it's not. And... Here's the thing, Caribbean Beach is already my least favorite moderate. Like I and that's saying a lot because Coronado Springs is it not the best either. But I there's so many things going against um Caribbean Beach already. This just does not help it in the slightest bit. No. So next on our list of news topics, um we want to send our well wishes to Richard, the greeter at Grand Floridian. Um, he's fallen ill with a case of pneumonia, um, and he mm-hmm. is not projected to get better. So we are going to send our thoughts out to him and his family, uh, as he's a staple of the Grand Floridian. Anybody that's been there has very likely met him or had some interaction with him. So this is, this is very sad news for fans of the Grand Floridian. Yes. And I kind of want to touch on something real quick as we're talking about this. It's really funny how um, how big of an impact some of the cast members truly do have on the parks, the resorts, and all of that. Um, I mean, to us, we, we know a lot of the people that are there. Like You recognize familiar faces. Um, and it, it truly does add that personal touch to the parks, and I think that's that's a lot of the reason that a lot of people really enjoy going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, the cast members and the interactions that you have with them are really what makes it. And you know, especially when you have you know, a long running cast member like this that so many people recognize and so many people you know have all these these pictures over the years with. You know, it's it's. It's sad to see something like this, but at the same time, you know, it kind of reinforces why so many people love Disney. Yeah, that's definitely the truth. And it it really is such an amazing thing that there are long term cast members like this that, you know, devote so much of their life to to being that important part of Magic Kingdom. 
or mm-hmm. well, not even just Magic Kingdom, but all of the Disney parks. So, last up, we have news that Tambu Lounge at the Polynesian is set to go under a massive three-month refurbishment. Um, lots of things changing here. Looks like they're getting new equipment, change of scenery in the building. Um, bartenders are going to have more room to move. Lots of interesting stuff. I'm very interested to see how this whole refurb comes out. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I know a lot of people are, at least from what I've seen online, kind of skeptical about this because Tambu Lounge was, you know, an original staple to the Polynesian when it opened. And nobody likes to see original stuff getting taken away at Disney. But at the same time, you know, I'm kind of hopeful about this. And I I think it could definitely be improved by having more seating and being able to serve more people because... A lot of people like to hop to the Polynesian and, you know, the Tambu Lounge isn't that big and Trader Sam's certainly isn't that big. So they can't really expand on Trader Sam's, at least not the lounge. So I think that this is this is a good move, I think, in my opinion, to expand and be able to serve more people. Yeah, I agree. I feel like every time I go, I feel like the bartenders are like crawling over each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be nice for them to have more space, too. I'm wondering, like, if it's going to be a bigger, like, bar, or if they're just going to utilize the space that they have better. You know, I I would be cool if they take that whole just small seating area to the side away, because I see some people sitting there, but there's also a lot of other seating, like, right to the side of that on the little, the walkway area that, that goes on the second floor, like, right next to where the... Um, like the hostess for Ohana is, I, I think there's plenty of, of seating up there. So I think that they should really just m- continue the bar over to that whole little seating section. Yeah, that would be cool. Be cool. So are you guys ready to dive into the topic this week? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. So first up, we want to talk a little bit about um, just kind of the overall feel of animal kingdom i know we touched on it last week but this week we're going to be going over uh africa and asia and i want to do some conservation notes because our resident animal friend beth uh (laughs) has has a lot of notes on conservation so i want to give her the floor and go over some of the stuff about conservation that that you know in the disney parks yeah so Um, Just for a little bit of background for anyone, I don't know if I've mentioned this many times on the podcast, but I actually volunteered at my local zoo for four years, so I kind of got really nerdy about conservation during that time. I've always been pretty into conservation and environmentalism, but that kind of solidified it, so Animal Kingdom is by far my favorite park for that reason. I think it's so cool how much conservation goes into this park, how, how much conservation efforts go into this park. Um, just, you know, speaking generally, uh, everybody's seen, you know, those Disney Conservation Fund pins, you know, usually when you make a purchase, they'll ask if you want to donate money. And I think people mostly do it for the pins, but it actually is really cool because uh, like a hundred percent of that money goes towards different programs for, uh, conservation um so yeah 100 percent of the profits are donated directly to nonprofit organizations around the world um disney has participated in a bunch of different programs like itself the one that's most recent that i thought was really cool is called the connect to protect program and it corresponded with the opening of Pandora. So I don't know if you guys have heard about it. I don't know if it's still going on, but it was an interactive mobile game, like an app that you would get, you would get on your phone and you would interact with this specialist chat, like in a chat. And, uh, you would get sent on different missions. And by completing missions, um, I think you just had to complete one mission and you could unlock a $10 contribution to the conservation fund. And if you didn't want to do the mission, 
you could just chat with the specialist and it would unlock a $5 donation. So to celebrate Pandora's opening, Disney committed a million dollars to uh, different like habitats, like conservation of habitats of at-risk species. So they did $100,000 per species. It was, I believe, 10 different species and it was apes, butterflies, elephants, coral reefs, cranes, monkeys, rhinos, sea turtles, sharks, and tigers. So I thought that was incredible that people work together for this Connect to Protect program and Disney donated a million dollars to these programs that because is, of it. That's really cool. And, you know, not only are they taking, you know, just, just to donate that money would be cool, but now they're getting people to, you know, actively participate and get excited about it. Like, that's mm-hmm. that's pretty cool move. That's really cool, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think a big thing about conservation is just educating people. That's when I volunteered at my zoo, I was a volunteer in the education department. So my whole thing was trying to inspire people to, you know, go out, do your own research and try to make a difference. So that even that small step, I think is really awesome that Disney did that. Um, So also um, on the note of conservation. So Disney is accredited by an organization called the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Uh, Most really like good zoos in the United States and you'll see is are accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums or AZA. Um, So the AZA is basically it's an organization that determines minimum standards so they analyze conservation efforts, education, research, uh, different things and the institutions have to adhere to these standards in, a, in order to be accredited, and they have to get accredited every five years. So it's an ongoing thing. It's not just like a one and done. Um, so they're, they have like a commission that comes in, and they look at different aspects of the institution, like the animals' habitats, what their like health programs and like caretaking programs look like, um, the social groups that they're in so certain species if you're accredited by the AZA like for example the zoo that I used to volunteer at it's called Riverbanks here in Columbia Um, the minimum social group for elephants is three so you can't have an elephant habitat without at least three elephants if you're accredited by the AZA so um, two of our elephants we had four two of them actually passed away so the zoo is in talks now of whether we're going to get another elephant or whether we're going to have to transfer those elephants to other zoos, which I think is awesome because it, you know, enforces the fact that they need this group, like a certain size group and that, you know, for their f- mental well being, And, um, just, that was just like a little side note there. I'm going to try to keep this brief. You guys, I, I know I, uh, <laughs> I can I can definitely go off on a tangent about conservation. So if well, anybody has the, any, really cool. The cool thing about it is, is that it definitely pertains a lot to Animal Kingdom. Yes. So it's totally on topic. So drone away as much as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll try to wrap it up so we don't spend the whole episode talking about conservation. But side note, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about it, please feel free to email us or message us off Facebook. I will talk about it with you all day long. Um, so. Um, so the AZA also has a program called the Species Survival Plan, and it's called the SSP for short. Um, so it's their breeding program, and basically the AZA coordinates like which zoos are going to like which species are going to be able to reproduce at which zoos. So basically, if you're an AZA accredited institution, you have to get permission for your animals to breed or they have to like reach out to you and say like hey we're going to give you authorization for these animals to breed and they have a stud book for each species so that it kind of ensures genetic diversity so that we have like nice strong uh, individual animals here Um, so Animal Kingdom in particular participates in 35 different species survival plans and they have helped many different species um the most notable ones being western lowland gorillas and black rhinos 
as well as African elephants. So, and all of the animals that I just mentioned are some some form of endangered, but specifically the western lowland gorillas and the black rhinos are critically endangered, which is like the highest priority. Um, so yeah, Disney, I think is it's awesome how how much conservation you don't even see in the parks, but like we were kind of talking about with Pandora, I think it's it's really good to have that interactive element and you know make people aware because I think that that's half the battle. It really is, and it's cool that Disney is actually sorry Disney is active in their efforts to really keep up with that theme of conservation and carry it through their parks. Mm-hmm. So, do we want to dive into Africa first? Sure. Okay, so um, I don't know if we went over this with the last ones, but while looking at the map, I, I found the animal highlights section, which will tell you what exhibits are in that section of the park. Um, so this one specifically has elephants, lions, gorillas, giraffes, hippos, Columb. Why did my thing correct? Is that Columbus monkeys or is it Columbia? I think it's Columbus. Colobus. I think oh, that's okay. actually the species. Okay, cool. So Colobus monkeys. I thought that was an autocorrect fail right there. <laughs> um, zebra and tarantulas. So my question to you guys is where are the tarantulas here? Because that had me a little worried. I think... It... They're just roaming throughout the park. <laughs> Watch out. So I, I know that there are, you know, when you're going through the, the bird sanctuary, you go through that little... Oh, that's even look, more terrifying. <laughs> it looks like, yeah, it's like a little classroom, I don't know, research lab looking room. Oh, uh, okay, I know what you're talking about. that's where they are. Yeah, there's a couple other little, like, reptile and turtle exhibits and that kind of stuff in there, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, the reason I wanted to highlight this is because, for me, I think a lot of the cool features of, um animal kingdom or that there's so many different things to discover no matter how many times you go through it um i'm constantly every time i'm in this park finding a new exhibit or something like that that i haven't really noticed before just because of how it's laid out do you guys kind Mm -hmm. of feel the same way about that or is that just a a me thing oh no definitely yeah i totally agree you know it's it's funny now because there's so much to do with especially with pandora opening but it's it's the one park that I can go to and not do any attractions and still have a lot of fun at just experiencing all the animal exhibits and everything. So mm-hmm. there's definitely a ton to do there. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but let's bring it to the first attraction, which is Festival of the Lion King. Um, this is, I guess we can describe the attractions and go into a little bit of detail about them because we didn't really do that last week. But... The Festival of the Lion King is a stage show. Um, Disney quotes it as kind of an, a biggest Broadway show. It's about 30 minutes long, has a bunch of songs and pageantry and stuff going on through it. So it's really fun. Um, but the one thing I do want to say is that we were talking about Finding Nemo the Musical last week. And ever since then, it's been like really stuck into my head that I want to go see Finding Nemo the Musical again. And I looked up videos of Finding Nemo the Musical, and I was like, oh, I want to watch a Festival of the Lion King video. And then I watched that, and I was like, wow, this really needs an update. Um, (laughs) I I love this, and it has such a dear place in my heart, but it feels a little dated to me. I can kind of understand that. I I love this show, and I think it it does a really good job for you know, the theatricality of it, but are you speak like, are you talking about the, uh, I guess they're not animatronics, they're puppets. Well, kind of everything. I mean, it's nice cause they got that new theater recently. Um, so it's, th- some of it did get updated, but to me, it's just, I don't know. Something about it feels not as, I guess, grand as it could be. I actually haven't seen it since it moved to the new theater. I don't think there's really much difference. I think maybe there was just some, like, uh, layout changes and, like, scenery stuff, but Mm. honestly, not much changed, if I remember right. 
I think I've only seen it at the new theater, so I don't have much to compare to. But I, I do like it. It's it's definitely not an every time I go attraction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do I like how they you know they get the crowd interacting with it and everything. It's it's definitely fun to do. Um, fun side note about crowd interaction. Oh, it's no. like. <laughs> so the first time I went to Disney World as an adult, I went to go see this show. I think I was 20. And my friend worked at, I think she worked at Animal Kingdom at the time. She still works in, in Disney World um, now at Epcot, but she was kind of being our tour guide. And I was there with her and my best friend. And so she was friends with the, you know, the... I guess usher type people at festival of the lion king so she got us like the best seats in the lion section and like it was awesome and you know the part where they're like trying to get kids to volunteer to come do the noises for the different animals yeah. well this is me as an adult in total like childlike bliss they're like we need a volunteer and i was like bee, bee, bee. <laughs> and i like raised my hand at me like a big ruckus and the person like looked at me and they're like okay and like picked me and another like a little kid and so both of us went up there <laughs> and had to do the lion roar in front of the whole theater but i was like totally into <laughs> it i was just like i'm you know thank you for letting an adult do that for a change that was really yeah. special Thank you for letting That's me cool. release my inner kid. Yes, exactly. So, do we want to move on to the next attraction? Yeah. I think this is, yeah, this is the big one. Okay, the best so... Best one. The biggest one on Africa side is Kilimanjaro Safari. Which is the... I feel like that's so self-explanatory. It's a safari ride. Um <laughs> I don't even feel the need to read the description because that's just so self-explanatory. Um, but I, I love this ride, and I kind of did a little bit of research just for timeline sake because I don't know if you guys remember the Big Red storyline. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I very like distinctly remember that. So I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit because the history of this ride is really cool and weird. Um, but for those of you that don't remember it in its former iteration... Originally, the safari kind of started the same way, but it was more tailored towards conservation. So leading up to the attraction, there's kind of videos spread throughout, um, which I don't know if you guys have watched those videos, but they're, like, very depressing. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's, There's a man in a very, like, thick African accent that's talking about poachers and hunting animals, which is really odd in the kind of theme of the ride now but previously the attraction was very heavily into um protecting animals from poachers because the first half of the ride carried on like it would and then about halfway through the attraction your ride would be called by i don't even know what you would explain him but his name was wilson um and you would be called out to go track down some poachers that were in the elephant exhibit um which there you would kind of go through the the story of trying to save Big Red and Little Red. Um, and that's where my memory starts to get a little hazy of this. Do you guys have any re- memory that's a little bit more distinct before I dive into what I kind of researched on it? Well, I definitely remember this storyline existing. Um, I don't want to go too far ahead, but I always thought that this was like a really cool like way to spin it and you know make it geared towards conservation i do think that it was a little too dark for a theme park (laughs) but i think that they could have still kept a similar storyline and made it you know made it work because i thought you know it's it's exciting especially it's like a kid you know where you get called on the radio and then the driver starts driving real fast and goes over like the creaky bridge and stuff and you're just like oh my gosh we're like doing stuff you know and like i still love the ride absolutely because animals but i just thought this was it was a really cool thing that they took away and i wish that they had just altered it to make it a little more kid-friendly 
And see, in in my opinion, though, I thought that the storyline kind of took a little bit away from the actual safari element of it. You know, and that's just me. Um, I could see but, that. But I, I do definitely agree the storyline was awfully dark. <laughs> it kind of reminded me of doing Circle of Life at Epcot. <laughs> like, I get, yes, it's, it's important to focus on the conservation aspect, but, like, I don't want to feel like garbage when I get off the <laughs> I still feel like garbage when I get off the attraction, and that's only because of the videos in the the start of the queue. Like, next time you guys go, watch those videos. Like, just take the time to stroll through it, and you'll hear him, like, talk about how they poach animals, and these animals are hunted for this part of their body. And I'm like, man, humans really suck. Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, I wasn't planning on going and poaching animals after I got off of this attraction, you know? It's like, I get that, you know, you want to be aware of the issues and hopefully do stuff to correct it, but at the same time, it's like, I don't think the people that are into poaching are getting on this ride in the first place. Right. Very true. Um, But to go into the history of the attraction a little bit, uh, I don't remember, and I couldn't really find too much about it that was super clear but the original ending one of the elephants was killed and i couldn't find a clear example on which one it was so i don't know if either it of was you guys big know. red was it mm-hmm. big red because that's what i thought yeah. it was they yeah, had like a, there was really, a little animatronic yeah really really legit red. looking dead elephant <laughs> okay mm-hmm. see and that's what i thought too and a lot of places said yeah it was big red and there was an animatronic but a lot of other places said no it was little red and it was only implied that he was killed and I was like, that doesn't sound right. Well, um, the so, big red was not an animatronic. It was literally just like a dead elephant laying there. But little red well, <laughs> was an animatronic, real cute, swinging his trunk back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So that was the... From what, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, so from what I remember, it was that originally there was, yeah, there was like the fake elephant carcass that was actually on the ride. And then they deemed that was too dark, so they removed it. And then it was just kind of implied, you know, that, that Big Red didn't make it because you only found Little Red. Okay, mm-hmm. so that actually sounds about right. Um, but that was the original ending of the attraction, and that was soon kind of, as we said, it was uh, it, pretty much too dark for the attraction. So Disney kind of had to make some changes along the way to cut that out. Um, but I actually, this is weird for me because I've never been able to find an attraction's full refurbished history like I could for Kilimanjaro Safari. Um, On Wikipedia, someone broke down that there was a whole bunch of refurbs to this that changed a bunch of different things, and I'm not going to go into all of them, um, especially the ones where it's like the Savannah's drainage system was replaced in 2004. Um, But in 2010, that's when they added the guided treks. Um, Have you done that, Beth? I feel like you have done the what like the walkthrough of the the safari oh no i have i would love to but i have not okay then maybe that was someone else that i was talking to um but you do have there they did add the tour in 2007 i'm sorry 2010 um where you can walk through the savannah and kind of get to see more of a personal up close experience with some of the animals um if you look hard enough on the safari you can actually see people taking those treks so you can kind of get an idea of if that's a tour that you might want to do. 2012, the little red portion of the ride was removed forever and replaced with a zebra exhibit, which was taken away fairly soon after that, if I remember correctly. Or am I misremembering that? Because my memory is really bad. <laughs> I don't remember seeing zebras. So... The thing that I read was that the zebras were in the attraction for about five to six months, and then they were taken out because they were too aggressive towards the vehicles. Oh, wow. Wow. That that made for some interesting memories. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, like, I'm sure I heard about this, but this is, like, obviously six years ago. I'm not going to remember reading that on the internet like I would something I read yesterday. Um, But then the next and final edition was the Nighttime Safari in 2016, which added the uh, false sunset, and I, I don't know. I haven't done the Nighttime Safari, so you guys can take over from here if you have. Oh, I love the Nighttime Safari. It's totally a different experience. I 
<laughs> Actually, the last time I did the nighttime safari was absolutely terrifying because I don't know <laughs> what my driver was on, but she was driving like a maniac. So, it, like, at one point, she hit a, like, a pothole, and my seat, my like, my butt literally came off the seat. She hit it so hard and fast. So, that was, uh, that was a little too exciting, I think, for the safari, but uh, just in general, the nighttime safari is really cool. They have, you know, it's, it's, it's shorter than the regular safari because they have to have, like, spotlighting set up, but I think it's really cool because it's, you know, the animals just seeing them in like a different atmosphere, different environment. And, you know, they, they do, from what I've heard, rotate the animals. So it's not the same ones that you would see during the day, whether it, you know, is it, you know, the individuals rotate or the species rotate? I'm not sure, but it's different animals. So that's kind of cool too. This is one of those things that I keep meaning to put on my, my like to do list, but for some reason I haven't been in Animal Kingdom at night and I think now with Pandora being open it gives a lot more of a reason for it to be here and they're really trying to expand Animal Kingdom and I guess Hollywood Studios to the same degree to be a full day park Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I don't know if you guys had anything else you wanted to add on the safari but that's my two cents I know I think we talked about this in a different episode but I just want to reiterate that I love riding the safari in the rain because A, you're on a ride outside and you're not getting soaking wet, but also the animals seem to really like the rain, so they kind of get, you know, come out a little bit more and seem to be a little, I don't know, closer to the vehicles and like kind of let their guard down a little bit, so just a little tip there. Hmm. My favorite fun fact about the safari is that the rocks that are in the lion section of the exhibit are air conditioned which (laughs) encourages them to come and lay out closer to the guests for you to see them so Mm -hmm. i think that's pretty cool that's so smart on disney's part too like Mm -hmm. how can we attract the animals to come closer to the vehicles but not actually get them right next to the vehicles yeah that's a really smart thing so after the safari, we have the Gorilla, Flar- Gorilla Falls Exploration Trails, um, which is the walkthrough exhibit in Africa, which includes gorillas, hippos, and exotic birds. I love the exotic bird portion of this mm-hmm. because you get so up close and personal with all of them. Yeah. Me too. I really like that. I'm like the nerd that has the like bird guide and is looking like walking around looking for <laughs> different species. <laughs> if I remember to find it, I got some really cool pictures of some of the birds in here. The old, not the last time, but like the time before that when I went. And this is, I mean, me being the person that takes my camera in every park. This is like my playground. I love the the trails in animal kingdom because there's just so much to see and like brian said you get so close to the birds and so close to all the animals it, it gives you a different feel than i guess a zoo would mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so after that we have rafiki's planet watch um do we want to break this down by chunks because there's technically three parts of rafiki's planet watch yeah so yeah. the first part of it is the express train, which is essentially how you get there. Um, you hop on a train and you go to Rafiki's Planet Watch, which kind of feels weird to me because it's so out of, like, it's so out of the way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But definitely worth the trip. I feel like a lot of people miss this because you have to take a train there. Yeah, I I agree. I do wish that the train, like, they would put more stuff to look at on the train ride i know it's not a super Mm -hmm. long train ride but you know you you know you ride by the facilities where they house the animals and sometimes if you're lucky they'll you know have i I, like i've ridden by once there was they were like giving a rhino a bath and that was pretty cool but obviously they can't relocate the facilities but they could add some like show scenes or something right yeah that's my only qualm with the train (laughs) Uh, after that, we have the conservation station, which is the essentially the exhibits 
in here, and they vary. Um, there's plenty of things to look at and see in the conservation station at Rafiki's Planet Watch. I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to talk about, with, or not like anything else, but anything you want to really touch on with that. So, have you guys ever seen a medical procedure going on? I haven't gotten to. I Yeah, I haven't been lucky enough to be there at the right time. I kind of almost was, but I was too little and my parents didn't want me to see it, so... Do you know I, what it was? It was... I forget what what they were doing, but they had a... It was either a lion or a tiger on, like, a table, and they had, they had had it, not down, but it was asleep. Um, and they were about to do something, but I, I cannot remember because it was so long ago. Mm. Um, but I remember it being there, and I remember, like, being able to see it, like, very v- vividly. So it is a really cool experience. I just wish I could remember it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like the conservation station just because I like talking to the cast members there because they are super knowledgeable about all of the different procedures that Animal Kingdom does you know behind the scenes and all the different species and the research and stuff and like I one time I was there I literally just stood there for like 15 20 minutes talking to a cast member and they were just like telling me the coolest stuff about how they analyze like different <laughs> this is the one the thing that I remember most but and it doesn't sound exciting unless you're a huge nerd like me they were talking about how they analyze the different fecal samples I knew you were going to say that because I have a story <laughs> about this too. And it was just so cool how they were talking, like she was telling me about how they like can determine like the fertility, like ovulation of the gorillas by looking at their fecal like specimens. And I just thought that was like such a fun fact for a huge nerd like myself. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um Yeah. But I I haven't been to Rafiki's Planet Watch in a while. I'm guilty of the whole, it's way too far out of the way. Um, but when I was younger, this was like a must-stop place. My mom is a huge animal nerd, uh, too. So she's kind of in that same category where she could sit and talk to the people at Rafiki's Planet Watch for like forever. And one of the things that I very distinctly remember was... A couple years back when we went with our whole family, my mom and I made the point to go out there like we always used to do. And we get out there, and I'm watching, like, looking at some of the the exhibits and stuff in there, and I'm I'm looking around, and I come back, and she's talking to one of the conservation people, and she's holding a thing of petrified poop. And I can't remember what animal it was. She swears it was elephant, but I feel like that's probably not true. Um, (laughs) And that's, like, a very distinct memory that we both share because they had a thing of petrified poop, and they let her hold it, and they talked to her about this animal's poop for, like, 15 minutes. So, I mean, there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot that you can learn from it, but I definitely would recommend talking to the people here because I feel like Animal Kingdom puts the people that are definitely going to invest the time to learn about the different species and things like you said, Beth, where... They, they have to know this stuff or they're going to be excited about it. I feel like this is where Disney's going to stick them. Yeah, and just to touch on what you were saying about your mom getting to hold the petrified poop, which is super cool. Um, they do often walk around with different types of biofacts. Um, I don't know what all they have in their storage, but just at my zoo in you know South Carolina, which is not nearly as big as Animal Kingdom, obviously. We had so many biofacts that were, like, so cool, like, elephant teeth and, like, giraffe hooves and all kinds of stuff that people, like, loved touching. They loved feeling. Because, like, just for example, the elephant teeth weighed, like, 10 pounds a piece. And just people, like, feeling the weight of that was just, like, super impactful. They're like, holy crap, these things weigh a ton. Like, literally. But, you know... Um, so just try to catch the cast members there and see what they're holding. Cause they probably have some super interesting stuff to tell you. Yeah, definitely. But the final piece of Rafiki's planet watch is the affection section, which is essentially their petting zoo. Um, pigs and goats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's really all I remember from being here. Their webs or their map says exotic animals, but I don't remember anything yeah, exotic. They're, they're stretching that a little <laughs> bit, I think. It's like what wild boars or something. Is that I, what they're trying to spin? I don't know. They didn't even list what it was. It just said rare and exotic domesticated animals. <laughs> Uh, I feel like rare and domesticated are kind of on two different ends of the spectrum. (laughs) Yeah. The one thing that I do kind of wish that Disney did, um, just from, like, I know that they probably don't have the means to do this because it's a little bit more of a stretch, but there's a zoo in Maryland that we went to a couple months ago. Um, specifically because they had tours where you could meet their animal ambassadors, where they, like, took them to schools and stuff like that. And they were essentially, like, domesticated versions of these animals where they, you know, they were on their regular diets and stuff, but you actually got to get, like, a close encounter with them. Um, And my girlfriend is a huge penguin freak. Like, she loves penguins. And this was a big trip for her because we got to go meet their penguin ambassadors. So we literally spent a half hour in a room with penguins while they told us all about, like, what they eat and, you know, how their feathers are built to, you know, let the water slide off of them and stuff like that. We actually got to, like, pet their penguins, which was super cool. And I feel like if Disney did something like that here, maybe that might be a little bit more impactful. Yeah. You mean specifically at affection section? Yeah, I feel like if they had more of, like, instead of just a petting yard, I feel like if they had some of their animals that could potentially have like more human interaction or even like just get closer with them and someone there to tell me about them i feel like a lot more people might make a stop out here yeah i think unfortunately that because they can make money off of like behind the scenes tours that they're not going to put anything like super exotic out there for free that's fair because you because they do they do i think a couple of tours where you get to get kind of more up close with like exotic animals i know they do an elephant one i'm not what sure if they do one with giraffes too yeah i'm not sure what animals are on the other tours but there's one that's specifically for elephants so you know people can pay to have that experience but it, i think I, you're right i think it would be cool if they had even just like you know a cast member and I think they do sometimes have cast members handling animals, like inside. Yeah, I, you guys I think correct you're right. me if I'm wrong, but no, sometimes right. they'll have like snakes and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think I think it would be cool if they had something kind of warm and fuzzy, cute animal out here that you don't get to see all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, to your point, which I just talked about and I already forgot about it the Wild Africa Trek tour does put you a lot closer to those animals and you are on it with a tour guide. Um, so that's probably why Disney doesn't do stuff like that. Yeah, that has been on my bucket list for a long time. But the thing that has kind of deterred me is the rope bridge. Because oh, I'm yeah. not a huge fan of heights. <laughs> Which is funny because I love roller coasters, but... <laughs> That's different, having to walk across a little rope bridge. I can understand, because I am the same way. <laughs> um, but let's move out of Rafiki's Planet Watch. We've spent enough time here and talk about the Harambe Market. Let's just lump most of that together, because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, have you guys eaten here, been here? Oh, yeah. Okay. This was this was one of our big stops Um really before Pandora opened to get quick service. Yeah, I think this is probably a much-needed addition to Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Um, Food's good here. You can get a lot of different things, um, from fresh fruit to ribs to pretty much anything that you could think of. Yeah, I love that they offer fresh fruit. I just wish it wasn't so expensive. How expensive mm-hmm. is it? Because I don't think I've it's ever like, bought fresh it's like fruit here. I'm not paying like two dollars for a banana. Ouch! You could yeah. buy a whole bunch of bananas for right. two dollars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you guys are stopping here, what's like? Where are you going? What are you uh, 
checking out in the Harambe marketplace. I'm mainly um, trying to talk my boyfriend out of getting a Mickey pretzel because I know he'll be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's one place. In fact, it's the only place I know of outside of the uh, uh, Club Cool at Epcot that you can get Bebo, which is the African Coke product, and it's really good. Yeah. I didn't even know you could get it here. It makes sense, yep. but that's cool. Yeah, that that is really cool. I think I've only eaten in here once, and I honestly think I just got the ribs from here, and they were pretty good, but... I, I'm very happy that they added Harambe Market in here. Mm -hmm. um, but also on top of that, we have... I'm just going to lump all of these eatery places and souvenir places together because we never really have too much to talk about in these tours when it comes to these. So we'll lump them together, we'll go through them, and then we can kind of talk about them a little bit. Um, but we have Tamu Tamu Refreshments, Dawa Bar. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce that coffee shop. <laughs> I think it's uh, Kusa Firi. That sounds about right. Mombasa Market, Zuri Sweet Shops, um, all fairly close to here. So lots of places to get a snack, uh, a cocktail, or as I'm sure Beth is probably <laughs> excited about, a Dole Whip. <laughs> Which is funny because I've tried it with coconut rum and I was not a fan, but I think... It's because I have bad memories of coconut rum. So I need to try it with regular rum, and I'll get back to you guys. This is one of those places where you can get that uh, that infamous adult whip, I guess, as you could call it. <laughs> Special whip. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, there's the Tusker House. Have you guys eaten at Tusker House? I have not. Me either. Okay, I have once... Um, don't really remember much about it other than the fact that it's a buffet um yeah i always like am so hesitant to go to buffets because i don't like to like sit down and eat for a long time and i also feel like every time i go to a buffet i have to eat until i'm uncomfortable to get my money's <laughs> worth Same. so as louis ck said the meal is not over when you're full. The meal is over when you hate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the thing that I will say, because I feel I feel like that on a lot of levels, but I will also say that Disney does buffets to some degree in a very different way. Um, a lot of times that you do a buffet on Disney property, it's either going to be some form of entertainment or character dining, which is the case here because you have the Donald's Dining Safari. Um, so a lot of places will entice you with the fact that you can meet all of the characters and stuff like that, um, and they'll come around to your table and greet you, and others do the entertainment, like Beer Garden and Epcot is a really good buffet, um, so they kind of counteract that with giving you a reason to stay longer. That said, I don't remember anything about Tusker House. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in their safari uniforms, which is really cute. Yeah, and I think that's the only reason that I remember it is because I'm sure I have a picture with Safari Donald somewhere. <laughs> um, so we can tie up the Africa section of this this tour, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on to Asia, which I after doing this and looking at all of the the food stops, I uh, noticed that it is actually a little bit smaller than Africa in terms of stuff that's in it, but I think that's just because of how many food stops are there. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about the animal highlights, which are the tiger, the gibbon, Komodo dragon, and lion-tailed... Beth, you're going to have to help me out with that because animal Macaque. names are not my thing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so cool thing to stop and check out. More animal trails. Super exciting. Anything you guys want to touch on with them? I'm mad because I've been here like the last 10 times and want to see the Komodo dragons every time. I never get to see the Komodo dragons. 
I was literally just thinking that. Like, I, I had to look on the map to see where the Komodo dragon is, and I'm like, that is so far out of the way. I have, well, I mean, every time I go there, they're either hiding or they're not in there or something. I've seen, like, the Komodo dragon cave, like, a <laughs> hundred times. I don't think I've ever seen the Komodo dragons. Uh, that's I'm trying um, to even remember where this is. I don't think I have either. It is. Um, it, I believe it's at the very beginning of the jungle track. I may be wrong. It is actually, yeah, it's at the very beginning of the jungle track, past the um, the section of monkeys that's there. If I'm remembering right, there's like. I think you're right. It's it's kind of pretty close to that. So, you know what? Let's let's skip over the first one that I have on this list and go to the jungle track, which is pretty much tying into what I just talked about with the highlights. Um, it's a self-guided tour of Southeast Asia, home to tigers, dozens of bird species, a flying fox, and a Komodo dragon, Hope I, we think. <laughs> We're not entirely <laughs> sure of that one. but <laughs> Well, they tell me there's one in there, but... <laughs> um, I like this. I like the fact that it's a walking tour, so I can kind of do it at my own pace. And I think mm-hmm. that's probably like my favorite part of this, because it kind of feels like there's safaris that you would see at a zoo where you can just kind of go through it at your own leisurely pace. You're not in a car with someone driving. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I prefer this one a little bit more than the one in Africa, just because I think there's a little bit better theming here and it, you feel kind of more like you're in Asia, like especially when you go to the, the tiger exhibit, like all of the architecture and everything around it is, is very cool. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with definitely. that. Definitely. And I love the bats, the little bat house oh, that they yes. have. It's like super cool. When I was younger, I was actually afraid of that. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I something can understand of, that. Something about like the the term bat house freaked me out. Yeah, I like that they have the sign outside of it that's like there are bats in here if you don't want to see them, keep walking. Apparently, it's pretty common for people to be scared of bats. I guess it is. But I think they're super cute. They just look like flying puppies. <laughs> so, do we want to move on to the next one? Yeah. So, the first thing on our list outside of the jungle track is the Up a Great Bird Adventure, um, which was formerly. Oh my gosh, Flights what was it called? Of Flights of Wonder. Yeah, thank you. I had that right before I started talking about it. Um, I haven't done this since it's been the Up show. Have you guys? I have uh, not. Really I'm okay. really excited to see it, though. So let's I talk love to, Flights of Wonder. Let's talk a little bit about Flights of Wonder, then. And, um, I mean, I'm sure that now they've pretty much just themed it with Up stuff. So it's got to be similar, right? Yeah, I'm we sure that. it it's is. It's probably totally different. Um, so do you guys want to talk about that a little bit? I don't know if you guys want to share any experiences from that or whatnot. Well, I would imagine that the show, like, in itself is probably really similar because imagine how much time they took to train these birds to go to this Mm -hmm. specific places and, you know, do the specific things that they do. And, like, I, I find it hard to believe that they would alter that too much and have to you know, start from square one with that. Yeah. But, but I, I always loved this show. Um, I, I just, I think it's really cute. It's really cool. You can get some amazing pictures from it if you're paying attention. And I like the bird taking the dollar bill out of my hand. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if they still do that. I don't know. That was such a staple of this show. I feel like they have to. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. But yeah, it's really cool to see and to get kind of like a first-hand experience of how smart these birds actually are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I I really like the idea that they have shows like this where it still highlights the animals and it's very much um, educational but at the same time entertaining. Which I feel like mm-hmm. we talk about that a lot. The edutainment value for a lot of the Disney parks is pretty high. But I, I really do enjoy that they have something like this here. Yeah, for sure. 
So next up we have Cali River Rapids, which I think is on my... I'm going to ask you guys a question really quick because I I had this moment earlier when I was talking to my cousin about Cali River Rapids, and we very distinctly remember it being a lot bigger and a lot faster than it actually was. Like, <laughs> both of us do. And then, like, we talked about it, and we're like, yeah, it's... The last time we rode it was, like, really slow. And I'm like, no, that's actually how the ride is. But we both had this, like, almost Mandala effect where we were like, yeah, this is something that was totally, you know, bigger and faster. And we asked, like, a whole bunch of other people in our family, too. And they were like, yeah, no, I remember it being like this, too. Um, But do you guys remember it being, like, super long and you getting, like, super soaked? Well, I've only ridden it a couple of times, actually. I mean, you still get pretty wet on it like i don't think anything's changed i just think maybe i was a lot smaller and and really uh imagined this to be a lot worse than it was it it must vary from ride to ride because i went on this maybe a year ago and i got just absolutely drenched on this thing yeah yeah i the first time i ever rode it was only like a few years ago and i literally was soaking wet like the water went down my back and hmm. I luckily had had a few drinks, so I wasn't as bad about it as I could have been. But I, I generally hate being wet walking around at a park. It had also been raining a lot that day, so I wasn't really concerned about it. But then I rode it directly afterwards. I was like, I'm already soaking wet. Let's ride it again. And didn't get wet at all. And I was like, how? How is this possible? <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe it, it does vary from ride to ride. But funny story about that. So the last, well, no, this was a while ago. We rode this one time, and you know, I've mentioned on here, my family used to go with all of us. We're a huge party. We took up a whole boat minus two seats um, for, like, a bunch of people that wanted to ride it. And my youngest cousin, who had to be, like, six at the time, like, he was pretty little, um, you know, we're all on the, the boat, and everybody's, you know, all happy. We're all riding it and everything, waiting for the drop. We go down the one drop, and he's the only one that gets wet. Like, he's the <laughs> only one that gets soaked, and he's sitting there just sobbing because he's, like, so freaked out that, that everybody else was totally dry, and he got wet. And as he's doing that, the boat turns, and we all go down backwards down the, <laughs> the next drop, and everybody but him gets soaked. So, <laughs> I, like, I love this ride for that reason, and I love the... Uh, I just think this is a fun attraction. Now, the one thing I do have to say is that there is a theme to this attraction, and it totally gets lost with me. I don't know if you guys feel the same way about this. I but, didn't uh, know there was a theme, so there obviously is actually, it did get lost. Yeah, there's actually a story. It's about illegal logging. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, which you can kind of get if you really, like, really look at the the scenery around it, because you could hear, like, wood chippers and see fire burning and... Like, like, you saying that, like, I can think back and it makes sense, but I totally would never have gotten that on my own. Right, and you really wouldn't unless you kind of look at it, which, I mean, to me, this doesn't need a theme, but this is almost like Chester and Hester's bad with me, and at least they tried to cover that up. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if you guys have anything else to say about River Rapids. My one gripe with it is it seems very short. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I think there's really only two drops. Like, if I'm thinking about it, I feel like that's probably the case. Two at least major mm-hmm. drops. Yeah, the one thing I will say that I think is really neat is, um, Mario, you were saying you rode with your family, so I don't know if you've had this type of experience, but... Um, the first time when I rode it and I got like completely drenched, it was me and my boyfriend and then like however many other people fit on the boat. And like when I got soaked, like the water like went on a, in a wave like on top of me, everyone in the boat and including me started like cackling, laughing. And it was just like these total strangers and you know, you're facing them. So you have to look at them. But it was it was just like a really fun experience to have that with strangers and everybody's just like laughing together 
<laughs> yeah, so the boats actually seat 12. Um, oh, wow. I know this because I'm looking at it right now, but when we wrote it, I remember we had two additional people in the boat with us. So, yeah, it definitely is one of those attractions that you are forced to ride with other people, and it does kind of feel like, in a way, it brings you all together because you're mm-hmm. all soaking wet by the time you get off of this. Now, I always love when someone's, like, about to go down the hill and they start, like, leaning and shifting and stuff. And it's like, it, you're not moving this raft. <laughs> Hold on tight. Oh. Now, the one thing that I do want to briefly bring up, because I found this out the other day. And I, I as I found it out, I remembered it a little bit. But they used to have the um, the waterproof compartments in the middle of this attraction. And now they're not there anymore. And They were pointless. They were so pointless. And that's like one of those things that I kind of wanted to bring up just because it's like, did they really think that this was going to be something they could just keep water out of with like a Velcro yeah. pouch? You might as well have just put like a napkin over your phone before you got on this thing. Those things never sealed. Well, we used to, when we went, I remember the first couple times we did it, we all would put our stuff in there and then you get soaked. So there were people in my family that didn't want to ride this attraction because they didn't want to get wet. So we would just hand off our bags to them. Like, it's so much better to just drop something off with someone or just accept the fact that your stuff is going to get soaked. Are there not lockers? There are. I was about there to say, are. I feel like there are lockers. But no, aren't they are. free for a certain amount of time as well? Uh, I believe yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. They were last time I went on this. Yeah, so at least you have that option. Yeah, that's true. Or bring a waterproof backpack. Yeah, that's also an option. Do we want to move on to the next one that I know we're all going to spend forever on? Yeah. So this is the highlight of this section of the park, uh, Expedition Everest. And we have talked very extensively about (laughs) this attraction on other episodes. Um, So I guess we can kind of keep it brief. Well, as brief as we can. (laughs) <laughs> but some little fun tidbits that I found are that um, there's a, an aviation limit in Florida, um, or actually it says federal aviation limit. So it's 200 feet, and you have to place a flashing red light on top of the, the structure. So Expedition Everest totals at 199 feet tall, just so it doesn't have to have that flashing light and break the immersion. Um, there are several buildings on Disney property that have this same kind of illusionary effect just to not have that flashing red light so i thought that was kind of cool just a little fun thing to throw in there yeah definitely um also along those lines um i haven't heard this but i'm sure someone else has apparently it's a common myth that this is the tallest mountain in florida which is certainly not true but it does come pretty close um I didn't know there were mountains in Florida. I did not either. Can you confirm that, Brian? There's no mountains in Florida. (laughs) I mean, none of any of any notable height. Well, apparently there's one. Yeah, apparently there's one that's at least taller than Everest, which is Walton Counts Burton Hilltop. It's four hundred, or sorry, three hundred and forty-five feet above sea level, whereas Expedition Everest's peak is three hundred and twenty feet above sea level. So. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call 345 feet above sea level like a a staggering peak. No, not really. Yeah, but a mountain in Florida, that just doesn't seem right. (laughs) I mean, okay, so around here, you drive through, like, upstate New York and Pennsylvania, and there's mountains everywhere, so that's nothing. Oh, yeah, same here in, like, North and South Carolina. So that's really weird to me i think that breaks the immersion and they need to tear that mountain down <laughs> <laughs> um but is there anything you guys want to talk about before we, we talk about the animatronic because i know that's where we're going to end up spending all of this time <laughs> yeah i know well, that- i think go ahead oh just leading up to the animatronic you know i love the theming and the storytelling that this ride you know does and and just pr- as it progresses through the ride you know, with the with the queue, when you get all these little hints of like of the yeti and everything as you as you're moving through it, kind of sprinkled in with the actual scientific stuff that's going on in the queue, it just really helped build that immersion and just the overall theming of this ride. 
Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I rode this, and I was, like, really in awe of everything going on. And mm-hmm. just that one section where it's kind of got, like, all the little statues, and it's kind of looks like it should be a fountain where people have thrown pennies in. I really love that section of the queue. Yeah, me too. I, I think that's, like, one of my favorite parts of this attraction. Uh, side note, speaking of throwing things, if you're one of those people that throws a hair tie at the top, please don't ever listen to this podcast again. <laughs> yeah, we don't want you as listeners. <laughs> No, I, seriously, don't do that. I totally, like, for some reason, never realized that that was a thing until, like, fairly recently. And I read I read somewhere that they, like, clear it out on a regular basis, and it still gets, like, filled up with hair ties. I guess I just never noticed it, but, like, I don't know. There, That's just insane (laughs) yeah i just have to like not look at all to the sides because that totally breaks the immersion for me yeah seeing a bunch of hair ties Mm -hmm. i hate that sorry that was my my little (laughs) step down off my soapbox (laughs) now (laughs) it's okay we all have those moments but let's talk about the theming up to this animatronic like brian was talking about we have already kind of gone through the queue um I think this ride, even as you get onto the attraction itself, like, not even just in the queue, just in the attraction, the second you board that train, to me, I kind of already feel like it's building the story. And Disney does this in a very good way with a lot of their attractions. We've talked about that before, that they just kind of slowly start to build you towards something. And then once you get to that climax in the story, they they move it pretty quick. Um but I really think that Expedition Everest has a good way of just building the suspense of knowing that something is inside of this giant mountain that you're about to go into. And then Mm -hmm. even like the climb up to the mountain is just super suspenseful. Oh, I'm going through the the little temple area is one of my favorite parts of this ride. Mm -hmm. Me too. Like the, the giant mural that's up there. Like I feel like a lot of people don't exactly notice it either, but it is, it's so and it's so big like it's a pretty you know obviously a lot of work went into that you know and it's one of those things that you like you hope the other guests really appreciate because it's such a cool part of the ride yeah i totally agree with that like there there's so many cool things that they did to just kind of build that suspense and a lot of people don't notice it Mm -hmm. um but then up until that point where do we, do we want to go up to the point with the, the mini Yeti projection, or do we want to kind of start talking about anything else on here? Well, I would say the, um, you know, the, the I, would, I don't know what you want to call it, the big plot twist of the ride when you, you know, come up to the broken tracks. I remember going on this as a kid for the first time and just going in there blind not knowing what was going to happen <laughs> and that just being one of the coolest like most mind-blowing experiences i've had at disney i wish that i had been able to go into this blind i remember when this first opened we were going down for one of our trips and um i don't know if you guys remember when disney used to like heavily push their vacation dvds do you Oh, yeah. Okay, so we always got the Vacation Planning DVD, and we always watched them. And the the year that this came out, the Vacation Planning DVD featured so much about Expedition Everest. So it was like watching a YouTube ride-through video before YouTube ride-through videos were a big thing. Um, and even then, coming down and getting on the Magical Express, they always play, like, clips of things. And this was a thing that they featured super heavily that year, too. Um, so I remember, like seeing the broken tracks before they were a thing and seeing some of the other stuff and even the yeti because when we went down i'm gonna skip ahead a little bit the yeti was in b mode at that point but the video is still showing the yeti in a mode so false advertising oh i was so (laughs) upset i was like i mean to be fair you really zip past this animatronic in like five seconds but i i remember being so like in awe of everything that the DVDs were showing and riding the attraction and like just knowing what was going to happen 
I was still super hyped about it. And I still loved it just as much, but it still like kind of felt like it spoiled it a little bit for me. Hmm. Yeah. yeah my, my first experience with this, you know, I, I, like I said, I went into it blind and I was lucky enough to go as, as close to opening that they were still running the Yeti in a mode. And just like to this day, that, that is probably I'll, I'll say up to experiencing flight of passage, like the most awe-inspiring thing that's ever you know that i've done at disney yeah side note i'm like super excited to ride matterhorn bobsleds this weekend (laughs) oh are you you going this weekend yes saturday that is gonna be so cool because their yeti actually moves you know the funny (laughs) thing about this is that i'm leaving that in the episode and for the people that are listening you're, you're gonna be there already oh true um, <laughs> so time travel beth but well, like, listen in next week for my recap <laughs> but i'm really excited for you too you'll, you'll have to tell us how it compares in um to this attraction because i've heard a lot of comparisons between the two yeah definitely. even though i know they're totally different i've tried not to watch too many videos because i i like everything being a surprise but i did cheat a little bit so i'm really (laughs) excited but let's talk about the animatronic because we've kind of touched on this a little bit um so who wants to talk about this because i know we can all kind of go on here this is this is the single greatest travesty at, at disney world um one of my favorite things about this attraction is the fact that Disney Imagineering took the time to build this incredibly complex and large scale animatronic that you would really only see for five seconds. Um, and I think that speaks volumes for how much Disney really wanted this attraction to just have the best feel that it could and how they, they put so much into everything they work on. Unfortunately, there were some things they didn't really think about. Um, So for the first couple months that this was open, the Yeti ran in what was called A-mode, which was where it would actually swing its arm down and kind of lean in towards the vehicle. Um, Apparently, it would move about 5 feet horizontally and 18 inches vertically, which feels like a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. But it would move towards the vehicle. Uh, Unfortunately, due to the stress of the yeti's motions it would kind of it caused stress on the foundation and they had to stop the yeti from moving and it was later placed in b mode which is essentially a still move or still yeti figure with some strobe lights on it and Boring. it's That's a shame <laughs> i if i remember to put the the video of the actual a yeti test footage in the show notes I really encourage everyone to just check that out because it's so incredible mm-hmm. how this this. I would almost recommend against it because it just kind of makes it seem not as cool after seeing what it could be. Well, and the whole thing is like I think the reason that Disney Imagineering hasn't put all the time to fix it, and obviously aside from the fact that they would have to shut this ride down for extensive refurbishment and potentially crack open the structure and cause a lot of horrible sight lines um i think the reason they haven't really done much with it is because you don't see it for long and i think that's what ultimately is kind of its downfall Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know on that point it's it's so incredible if you do go and watch the video of it running in a mode in in the test facility it's it's crazy to see how much detail went into not even the moving parts but just like the hair and the skin and everything that are on it like it's so incredibly detailed for a you know an animatronic that you're moving very quickly past that's in a very dark section of the ride yeah definitely like, <clears throat> i just i wish that they could have done something to preserve this but i know that we'll never see it function in a mode again and that's kind Mm -hmm. of the thing that really sucks is that like you know that it has the ability to like you know somewhere in everest the controls are sitting there to turn that thing on but they just never will yeah yeah it's depressing 
So, do you guys want to touch on anything else with Expedition Everest, or should we move on to the next section? I'm good. Yeah. So next on our list is Rivers of Light, which is, I guess, Animal Kingdom's answer to a nighttime show. I guess you could call it that. I don't know. I honestly have not seen the show all the way through because the time that I tried to go, I was like, I had heard so many bad things about it. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to give it the benefit of the doubt. And I got to see it once. I So I, I like went sat and waited we got good seats where it started and i was like wow this is like this is pretty this is really neat and then everything stopped moving and they had to like reset the show and then they did it then the same thing happened again and everything stopped moving and they're like all right sorry everybody we're canceling it tonight and i was like cool i never want to see this show (laughs) but at least it's not the jungle book Oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was the worst thing I think I've ever seen at Disney. It was truly horrible. Like, everybody knew that it was a cobbled together mess of a placeholder until they got Rivers of Light open, but even going in there knowing that, it was still awful. And it ran a lot longer than it was supposed to, too. Mm-hmm. Well, because Rivers of Light kept getting pushed back and back. I remember that because they they kept having issues with like the floats and stuff, and things were just going wrong with it left and right. And there was a point where we thought it was never going to open. I remember that very distinctly. Mm-hmm. And you know, the thing that really sucks about Rivers of Light, the thing that like really takes me out of it, is that I wanted this this to be really good. <laughs> like, I, I remember when Disney was hyping it up and they were talking about how um, how cool it was going to be and, like, all the different things that they were going to do. And then, like, it came out and I was really let down. Yeah. I, You know, it's... I think they were trying to shoehorn a nighttime show into a park that really did not need it. Well, here's the thing. I, I see why they did it, because you're. I think you're right. I think you're 100% on the nose with that, that they were trying to put something here that didn't fit and it didn't need to be. Um, but the issue with it was, was this was around the time that Pandora was coming. Like, we knew Pandora was coming at this point. Mm-hmm. And they put in the nighttime safari, they put in a nighttime show. I think this was their way of trying to gauge to see if people would stay in Animal Kingdom late. And... I think it worked for a little bit because people saw that Rivers of Light was here and that there was a nighttime show, but then the reaction from it is probably not what Disney wanted. Yeah. I would say it's definitely not what they wanted. So I that's my hot take on it, is that I think that that was Disney's way of being like, oh, look, Animal Kingdom's a nighttime park now because Pandora's going to look better at night. Yeah, I totally agree. I I wish I could actually comment on Rivers of Light, but... Again, I haven't actually seen the show all the way. <laughs> I don't think you're missing too much. I yeah. just remember when it was first up and running, there were so many reports of it, like you had not running right, or actors not being in the right place, or things not going off the way it was supposed to. Which they is incredible. They extra like, a year and a half to prepare. Right, you know? exactly. Which is... I. I hope Disney learned their lesson about putting in shows like this before they're ready. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, the the thing about it is, is to me at least, um, the only thing we have to really compare this to would be Phantasmic. And even that's kind of a loose comparison, but... I'm actually a, sh- a little offended by that. Well, I mean, if you think <laughs> about like the inner workings of the, the show, No, I get, I get what you mean. Right. <laughs> I mean... It's not even close. Fantastic is significantly better. But <laughs> the the thing that sucks is like the only thing you have to compare it to is obviously Fantasmic, which has been running for so long now that even when things don't necessarily go off the right way, there's some kind of recovery to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, except in the case of if one of the doors falls off the boat. But <laughs> <laughs> do we want to move on to the next couple things because there's not much to say about rivers of light 
Um, I put a couple of the food carts on our, our list, but I also forgot to put Yak and Yeti on here. Because apparently I didn't scroll to the right of the map a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Yak and Yeti for a little bit before we go into these uh, food carts and cocktail things. Yeah, I... It's pretty... It's good Asian food. Yeah, I love Yak and Yeti. I feel like this was the go-to place to eat for a while in Animal Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Is there, like, anything specific that you guys get from here? Anything you guys want to recommend? I would usually just get the the fried rice with, uh, you know, I'd switch up the meats from time yeah. to time. But, yeah, they have really good fried rice. Fried rice is a must. Yeah, I think I just got, like, I mean, is it lo mein with, I think they put a bunch of veggies and tofu on it. That sounds mm. about right. So. But, yeah, yeah it was yeah, pretty cool. Be. Like, I we actually got a table by a window upstairs, which was kind of nice, because then we could kind of people watch at the same time. So that was cool. Mm. You know, the funny thing about this, too, <clears throat> and I think this was maybe kind of a misstep on Disney's part, is that there's Yak and Yeti that is the, like, the... St- the place that you could sit down, and then there's the outside food counters of Yak and Yeti. So, something about that just feels really off to me. Yeah, I've never gotten food from the counter, so... The counter's I think not that's the good. only time yeah. I've actually done it. That's the only time I've ever gotten food from it, too. <laughs> hmm. But, it's not bad. I mean, it's it's a good quick service, I think. I think it was, like I said, the staple of Animal Kingdom quick services for a while. Yeah, and and now I would still probably recommend Satuli Canteen over it, but Yak and Yeti is definitely a close second. And, I mean, if you're in this part of the park, because it's directly opposite from Pandora, I, I think this isn't a bad spot to go. Mm-hmm. So we, I guess, we can close this out with the, uh, the snack stands and all of that that are in there because there's plenty of them um, along with like the souvenir stores anything special to talk about here or (laughs) the margaritas are really good yes I forgot where do you normally get those the outposts Mm -hmm. yeah I think you can get them at multiple kiosks but Hmm. Yeah, the strawberry one. And it's kind of like a, a mixture of places on this map because there's a lot of places to stop here um, to get like snacks and different things to eat or shop at. But usually we don't have much to say to these, so I kind of figured we could lump them all together. Yeah, drinks <laughs> and food and snacks. And places to shop where you can buy Expedition Everest souvenirs. They have yes. those cute little, like, plush Yeti things in the store that you can buy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm a fan of those. That's not canon. <laughs> <laughs> the Yetis look totally different in, like, most of the merchandise, so... It's kind of hard to say what is and isn't the official Yeti for Expedition Everest. It's true. If they were to make, like, a scaled-down, like, tabletop version of the Yeti animatronic, I can't tell you how much money I would spend on that. <laughs> but let's That'd talk about cool. let's talk about the real thing that they should do. They should put a Expedition Everest Yeti walk-around character outside of the attraction. That would, would be, be pretty awesome. cool. <laughs> but what does he do? Does he just stand there while someone like plays a strobe light in front of him? <laughs> That's awful, but probably true. <laughs> oh my god! It'll it won't even kid, be like a... pull it on his arm, mommy. Why isn't he doing it? <laughs> it, won't, it won't even be a cast member. It'll just be like a wood cutout. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, that's awful. So, before we tie this week up, is there anything you guys want to talk about? Um, overall theming wise for Animal Kingdom <clears throat> um, I mean I don't... other than it's incredible yeah we could talk about everything not just like these sections we talked about too 
Yeah, I mean, like you said last week, definitely the most cohesive steaming throughout mm-hmm. the park. Yeah, I absolutely love this park from start to finish. Hmm. So, um, real quick, there's an email I wanted to read, but <clears throat> I guess we can we can tie up uh, this week's show with a listener email. I do want to apologize because I've been really bad about responding to these emails. Um, there's three of them in here that I'm going to respond to directly after we record, but I do apologize in advance. Um, <clears throat> but the one that I wanted to read is that one of our listeners, Rebecca, is going to <clears throat> Disney for her birthday in 2021 as an adult. Um, <clears throat> I'm, like, losing my voice already. And she wanted to get some tips on things to do for her birthday while she's in the parks, um, kind of as an adult, because a lot of the things that you see advertised for Disney are more kid-friendly stuff. Um, Dranks. Yeah, so that's... (laughs) (laughs) That is pretty much the summary of that email. Um, Also, she had said that her future husband, currently fiancé, but they'll be married before the trip. So, future husband has never been to Disney, and this is his first experience as an adult. So any advice would be cool. Things they can look forward to would be appreciated. Um, Probably going to give a better rundown in the actual email that we're going to respond to, but I figure this is kind of a fun topic because that is a really common misconception is that Disney is for kids. So I know I've heard that a lot, and I'm sure Mm -hmm. you guys have too. So we could definitely take a moment to kind of combat that. I resent (laughs) that sentiment. (laughs) (laughs) Well... So I have a a friend that, you know, my girlfriend, myself, my cousin, and her were all planning to go to Disney together at one point. Or we were trying to convince her to go to Disney with us at one point. And she kept saying, no, Disney's too much for kids. I don't like Disney. Like, I don't like the Disney movies or the animated movies or anything. And I think that that's such a negative look on it. Because there's so many things outside of, like, Disney IPs that you can do in the parks. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, the people that I normally hear that from are people that either haven't been or they haven't been since they were a kid. And they only did the kids' stuff when they were there when they were a kid. So, you know, I I can definitely see why a lot of people would, would think that if that's the only experience they have. But there's definitely a ton of stuff for adults to do. There's also a third category of people who say that, and it's people who have lost their will to live. (laughs) So (laughs) They've lost the spark in their life. Uh, Would you say that they've lost that one little spark of imagination? (laughs) They have lost that one little spark. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But really quick to bounce off of that, I would say my first thing that I want to say to this person is that you should just let out your inner kid right Mm -hmm. off the bat no matter what you want to do just be a kid have fun even though you know you're saying you're an adult um this is like my one place to kind of escape reality and i'm sure that you guys can agree to that too so going Mm -hmm. to disney and even being an adult and just riding the attractions that are made for kids it's it's a way to kind of relive my childhood and have that kind of reconnecting with my inner child moment. Mm-hmm. Definitely agree. Uh, I was just going to say, I know this is kind of my shtick here on the show, but attractions are very different when you're sober and not sober, so you should try them both ways. <laughs> it's become my shtick, but I'll take it. <laughs> But Beth's already mentioned drinking around the world, and she mentioned that as well in her email. So that's definitely something you could do. Um, That is the common answer to, what can I do in Disney as an adult? But I think the best thing is to just release your inner child. Um, I'm sure you guys would also agree resort hopping can be tons Mm -hmm. of fun. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just, you know, let's go eat dinner at another resort for the night. Um, Also... If she's going for her birthday, and she, if you like attention, you should definitely get a button. Because oh, yeah, and if her fiancé is doing a first visit, he can get a button, too. Yes, so. because they that's 
that's super fun. I went close to my birthday. It wasn't actually my birthday, but it was close enough. And wore a birthday pin and had cast members stop me all day long. And even had one literally stop me to sing happy birthday. So <laughs> if you like the attention, that's pretty and fun. The too. buttons are super easy to get too. So if you want to get one, all you have to do is when you check in or any guest service counter, just say, hey, it's my birthday. Hey, it's his first time. Or the other thing that I like to do, I know I'm kind of in the minority for this, but whenever I book a trip, I'm either calling about dining reservations or calling to check up on something with the resort. So I know a lot of people like to use the app now, but I'm big on like, hey, I have to call Disney and make sure that everything's going good with my reservation. Just casually slide it in. Just be like, hey, I have a reservation for my birthday or hey, we're coming down for my husband's first trip. And the cast members will take a note of that. That is something that they are trained to look for. So if you don't want to get the attention and be like, hey, can I have one of those buttons? Like, You can be subtle about it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, don't go into it expecting anything, but make it, it's, you know, like a pleasant surprise when stuff happens. And I, I will say my final piece of advice, I think we've actually gone through pretty much everything I wanted to say, um, but one of my final pieces of advice is find a restaurant that you really want to eat at, specifically sit down, and just go wherever it is. If it's at a resort, if it's anywhere in the park, make that like a highlight, because Disney has some phenomenal dining, and I think that that's mm-hmm. you know, something that you probably won't appreciate as a kid, because most of us were probably picky eaters as kids and you know now as an adult Mm -hmm. I can go to these restaurants and be like oh my gosh this is so good I can actually appreciate it for what it is Mm -hmm. and definitely with all the expansion that's been coming to Disney Springs the past couple of years there's just a plethora of of fine dining across the resort now so is there anything you guys want to throw in there before we, we tie this up good to the environment <laughs> my final That's word all. my final words for this <laughs> week are that cali river rapids theming is just as bad as chester and hester's <laughs> that is what the note i will end this on <laughs> i i guess my my one wish is a mode yeti again then that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for joining us again on another episode of the Station 71 podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from so you don't miss an episode. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can find us on social media at facebook.com backslash Station 71 pod, Instagram at Station 71 podcast, Twitter at Station 71 pod, and you can send us a listener email at Station 71 podcast at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed your ride and we'll see you real soon. Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas.